And just like that, we're back with podcast 02 of the Low Oxygen Brewing Podcast series. Today we're going to discuss methods of a low oxygen brew house. And um, we are going to deep dive into that. This is actually like take three or five of this that, that hasn't been working out properly. So what we're going to do is we're going to deep dive into that. Hopefully by the magic of editing, we can um, splice in what I'm looking at, which is the paper and the website as I go along and go through. So we'll start in with methods of a low oxygen brew house and um, we'll give it a second to display. And basically, when you, when you go to lowoxygenbrewing.com, on the main site, you are brought to our main page, and the first thing on our page is the paper. We feel that the paper is the most important thing of the site, and that is, is to give you an overview and understanding of how to brew a low oxygen beer. So, like I said, the first thing on the page is methods of a low oxygen brew house. Um, on the top, you will find links to the page, uh, podcast. Be sure to check that out. That'll be updated with all the podcast episodes. We have our blog posts, our forum, our little venture we did with stout tanks and kettles, which was pretty phenomenal, uh, where I designed uh, a lineup of kettles and stout is manufacturing and selling said kettles. And if I can toot my own horn, they're pretty fantastic. Also, you'll see brew control. Uh, we recommend and use brew control, which is a, a brewing automation software. Um, it is top notch as well. So, methods of a low oxygen brew house. What is methods of a low oxygen brew house? Well, it's a summary of key process points and information concerning all that is low oxygen brewing. We, um, if you remember in the first podcast, we spoke much about the, uh, the, German Brewing Forum and uh, the people with uh, GermanBrewing.net and our group where we founded uh, the basis of it and how to create, but not really create, preserve uh, it. Um, in that paper, which uh, we spoke about on the first podcast, so we really don't need to go back too far into it. Um, It was black and white, uh, and and properly showed someone how to make uh, a low oxygen Hellas. So that's great and and everything, and that was the jump off point. However, with with the d division among the group, some of us uh, went some ways, some went other ways, uh, but we ended up here at uh, lowoxygenbrewing.com where we came up with our own paper, which tries to distill it down a little bit more into easier to follow terms. That was probably the biggest complaint, one of the biggest complaints with the uh, original on brewing Bavarian Hellas paper. So one of the other things we want to stress in this paper is that this is not just a, a German Hellas style specific process. All these breweries in Germany are using these low oxygen techniques uh, across their whole broad range of beer lineup. And uh, I apologize, it's winter in Minnesota and I have a cold, a little bit of a cold, so I got a little bit of the sniffles. But, um, we want to emphasize that 
all your beers, lagers, and ales will benefit from these methods, whether it be hot side and cold side or cold side alone. Um, a lot of our, our methods and procedures on the cold side are professional brewing techniques, um, along with the hot side too. 99% uh, of what's in our paper came from this book and others much like it, which are professional brewing books taught in professional brewing schools, um, written by professionals and brewing scientists. Um, so let me back up. Uh, Helles is not just the only low oxygen beer in Germany. There is every other beer style they brew. If it comes out of, you know, one of the larger macro German brew houses, it will be low oxygen. So the biggest thing we wanted to say is, uh, lagers and ales doesn't matter. They'll all benefit. So let it jump right into it. In the prerequisites, we, we kind of, in this section, we kind of, um, give an overview of some, what to look forward or what to, what to be, what to know about, uh, about brewing. Now, I'm not going to say that low oxygen brewing is going to rule out newer brewers and less, less skilled brewers, um, uh, because it's not, but Generally, the low oxygen brewing is more of an advanced brewing topic. So with the prerequisites, we assume that you understand at least some of these processes. And uh, we say, can you in the future or are you currently doing the following? Step mashing, low oxygen infusion step mashing with constant temperature. That would be a Herms, a RIMS. Uh, kettle rims or any other variant on wort recirculation. Can you hold temp, uh, consistent mash temperatures in a single infusion mash? Meaning, um, a lot of things we try and do in low oxygen brewing is to be decently precise in what we're trying to do. So if it's mashing, let's say in this case, we want to be able to hold a temperature you know, within a degree or two. We don't want to see giant swings because that's going to have an effect on the enzymes in your mash, if we're using the mash as an example, and it will influence the work profile that may influence the finished beer character. So beer is the sum of all parts, and the better you are at your parts, the better your sum, the better your sum, the better the beer. Um, do you have a method for rapid, rapidly chilling water and wort? And this will come into play later uh, with uh, pre-boil and actually a uh, knockout of the boil kettle. Yeast starters. Are you doing them? Do you know what they are? Um, do you know how to repitch slurry? Do you know how to store slurry? Um, can you get approximate yeast counts, um, preferably with a microscope? Uh, home brewing quote-unquote home brewing uh, yeast pitch calculators are often very incorrect. Um, assure yeast health, happy yeast, healthy yeast, ferments beer, uh, happy and healthy. Uh, can you control or monitor fermentation temperature? Again, using the mash example, it is very similar uh, that you want to be controlling fermentation temperature because... I guess my cat wants to say hi. Uh, because you want consistent temperatures and you don't want swings because swings could um, be detrimental to yeast and yeast health and wort and all that fun stuff. So can you monitor fermentation progress? And why we care about that is because we are going to generally spund. And we'll get more into that later. Uh, do you have a way to bulk store and monitor finished packaged beer? Uh, can you estimate and control pH? Another pretty important step. Uh, do you have an accurate scale for measuring brewing salts? And can you condition your grain? 
so that's just a few of the 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 things that we kind of delve into farther in the paper and um we will definitely get more into those uh as the sections come down so going down to uh notes on dissolved oxygen now dissolved oxygen is a pretty big part of what we do uh, it's in the name and we understand it fairly well so here's what we know about oxygen um, controlling DO levels in your wort and finished beer yields certain results controlling DO levels in the mash will preserve fresh malt flavors inherent in the grains themselves by guarding them against oxidation uh, from that point on, you are protecting those flavors that were preserved in the mash tun. And when we say lingering fresh malt flavors, we are talking about this preservation in the finished beer and beyond. Controlling DO's level, controlling DO levels after the mash to protect these flavors further. Uh, basically, these flavors will persist for varying periods of time on how much you control DO after preserving them. This is why controlling the boil and controlling DO levels in the cold side of the process is important. I'll strike that out and write paramount. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, we are undoubtedly saying HSA exists. And it's not just us. Again, professional brewing literature, all that fun stuff, uh, they know it exists. It's only home brewers who say it doesn't. And so um, what about DO do we need to know? So tap water slash RO water can be saturated between 8 and 12 ppm. O2 solubility is 4 to 5 ppm at mash temperature. Asterisk. Uh, depending on what your mash temperature is. And here's why. Uh, water, liquid, uh, can only hold so much oxygen. And it's all temperature dependent. The hotter the water is, i.e. boiling, it can't hold any. The colder it is to freezing, the more it can hold. And so tap water is going to be at about room temperature. Room temperature water, depending on the variables, sea level, pressure, etc., is going to put you in about 8 to 12 ppm. Okay, uh, because mash temperature is elevated above room temperature in the middle, you know, between boil and and room, it's going to be a little bit less. And so, what we know about that is that um, pre boiling. Oh, can um, or use this using this yeast scavenging method can reduce DO levels uh, to uh, at or below 0.5 ppm. 0.5 ppm is also 500 uh, ppb, and so that gets more uh, stupid cat. Uh, that is very important to us. And so um, what we do know is that uh, pre-boiling alone does not provide active protection against DO. And what that means is just because you can remove DO doesn't mean that DO isn't going to find its way back in. Due to the laws of partial pressure and all those other things, there's there's these constant reactions and these rules of how these gases want to exchange. All right, so metabisulfite, uh, sodium metabisulfite, potassium metabisulfite, uh, they go by Camden, K meta, uh, SMB, PMB. Uh, these are active scavengers. There's also a professionally packaged a solution that is called antioxidant SBT uh, that is made by AEB chemicals and um, they use a blend of uh, metabisulfate which is potassium uh, ascorbic acid and gallotannins and so what 
we will we will get more into those scavengers down in the other section so i won't i won't go too far off the rails there but we back on on the subject doe can add one to three ppm and that is because you are taking grains that have oxygen trapped in them adding them to the water that whole um process stirring mixing your turning water the surface water uh, the oxygen is trying to react with the surface water and that's what's happening um atmospheric diffusion rate of o2 is one to two ppm an hour like i said um the wider your pod is uh, the wider your surface area is um, you have oxygen trying to diffuse due to the laws of partial pressure into that oxygen and make that gas mixing happen. So that's why we get into um, capping and other things further down. Uh, copper, brass, and aluminum. This doesn't necessarily mean just in your brewing vessels. It means in your tap water. So water can contain heavy metals, copper, uh, manganese, uh, your brewing setup can contain copper, brass, aluminum. All these metals have the potential to uh, basically rub off or, or get in your brewing wort or water. And that can lead to what is called Fenton reactions, which is uh, oxidative reaction from oxygen and uh, these metals. So Brutan B may serve to mitigate these reactions. Brutan B is a gallotannin, which we will discuss a little bit further. There are a few different manufacturers making them. Uh, 0.15 ppm or 150 ppb DO during packaging is desired for maximum flavor st stability. And I will argue that the best number is zero for all these. If you can figure out a way to get zero oxygen into your beer, whether it be hot or cold side, that will be the best beer you can make. So uh, a simple list of some areas of improvement in equipment and process. So we want to eliminate splashing or unnecessary aer aeration. So what that means is um, try not to splash stir feverishly um just be gentle wart wants to be be held and caressed <laughs> as it were and so there are some some big stressors on wart there's heat stress or thermal stress which we'll get into with boiling and there's shear stress um shear stress is stresses upon the wart and beer by pumping stirring tight 90 degree bends high velocity um just general poor uh handling of wart so we we want to dial it back on that so we want to if possible eliminate copper brass and aluminum because as we talked about a little earlier there are potentials for fenton reactions um employ some form of an ant an active uh, antioxidant, which is some form of metabisulfate or uh, the, we call it a trifecta blend where you, you blend different antioxidants and we'll get into why you would potentially uh, blend those. And so that time to get into that is right now. So we have potassium metabisulfite. Uh, another just standard Camden, tab Camden tablet that you can find at your local homebrew store or wine making store or whatever. Um, and what we learned about potassium metabisulfite or K-meta um, is that several brewing science texts and papers uh, point toward elevated levels of potassium being detrimental to certain enzymatic actions in the mash. Um, Narcissus specifies keeping potassium levels under 10 ppm. That corresponds to 30 ppm of K-meta. If this dose provides you with sufficient enough scavenging, then feel free to use K-meta. If not, you may want to consider a sodium, which is Na-meta, 
or a trifecta blend. Antioxidant S SBT utilizes K-meta in its blend. So the reason why, ooh, where do we start? Um, the reason why, hypothetically, if I was a professional manufacturer of antioxidants, the reason why I would choose potassium metabisulfite is because when the metabisulfites oxidize, which they all will, whether it be in process or at the end when you uh, oxygenate, is that they have to break down and they have to break down to something. Well, that something in sulfites is sulfate, just like your, your standard calcium sulfate or your gypsum. Uh, but because they have another molecule attached to them, in this case, potassium, uh, potassium isn't going to affect your water chemistry. It will. It'll add potassium, of course. But that is not uh, something that is normally tracked in the brewing water process. And so it's more inert. Whereas sodium metabisulfite, which is basically the same thing, they have a little bit different uh, molecular uh, weights, so they have a little bit different uh, antioxidant potential, but we're splitting hairs uh, or atoms at that point. And so that doesn't really uh, go into your, your water uh, chemistry. And so that's why people will use that. Um, sodium metabisulfite is Na meta another standard Camden tablet you can get either or um, and when we first figured out that sodium metabisulfite could be used it was uh, pretty awesome but we knew that when uh, sodium metabisulfite broke down it did add Na or sodium to your brewing water now the the cavat or the 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 hinge was um, there was a starting dose listed in that paper. And in all fairness, 100 ppm of sulfites is a high level. Knowing what we know today, which is four years later, or five years later, you know, when we were doing our R&D in that, is that... Um, Metabisulfite is a fantastic oxygen scavenger, but it's really potent. It, it uh, once you start employing uh, antioxidant or anti-oxygen methods and procedures, capping, underletting, uh, that kind of stuff, is that 100 ppm was a huge dose when all you really need is maybe 5 to 10 ppm in a tight system. And even less if you have sealed vessels and you're purging, you don't need any. And so um, with that said, the first dose was 100 ppm. And that was the original foolproof dose rate. That was for someone basically who made no system improvements. And like I said before, when we spoke about the paper, it was a, a bulletproof 100% uh, for sure method and procedure that would allow you to get a low oxygen headless. With that, it was 100 ppm uh, meta, which is by today a huge dose. But the dose was, the paper was put out for people who had never even fathomed that low oxygen was a thing and we were assuming that they made no process adjustments so there's that so when we developed the paper at first we said 50 because even 50 was huge and so we'll, we'll, I, I think I'll wait and when we get lower into the mash uh, section we'll talk about like how much scavenging potential there is with the dosage uh, dosages so as you can see in the paper we keep lowering the dosage because we're finding out that when people start to implement these these oxygen oxygen mitigation techniques they need much less now 
it's not to say you can't use 100 ppm. It's not to say that my system, which is sealed and purged with nitrogen and has DO uh, sensor, five DO sensors that measures uh, hot liquor tank DO and any process uh, pipe uh, that it monitors DO in there, monitors DO in the mash, monitors DO in the boil kettle, monitors DO on oxygenation, and monitors DO in the fermenters. So even with that, I could use 100 ppm, and it would be fine. The biggest concern that we were running into is the people with the higher doses um, were having issues, and we'll explain those issues as we... Uh, progress down. So as with any of the dosing, we really recommend uh, sulfite test strips. You can get them on Amazon. They're fairly cheap. I think you can get like 100 strips for 30 bucks or somewhere around like that. Uh, the only issue is that uh, they read basically in 10 ppm amounts. I mean, it's close. But it can ballpark you, and you can figure out oh, where you're going to be. The, the biggest thing is, if you really want to properly tailor your dose, you're going to pick a dose, let's say 100 ppm, and you're going to monitor that dose with those sulfide strips through your process. And let's say you get done brewing and you have you have you know tight floating lids and you underlet and you whatever you're really tight with your process let's say you only used uh 5 ppm of sulfates sulfites i'm sorry 5 ppm of sulfites well in order to tailor your dose if you want the perfect dosage what i would do is account for maybe 5 ppm of whoopsie just in case you do have that whoopsie where uh you do splash something a hose falls off you got to go in you got to do something i would add a 5 ppm buffer but let's say it's 5 ppm uh from it's 100 ppm dose and after you're done boiling right before you get to oxygenation you're at 95 ppm sulfites so you expended 5 ppm of sulfites which is still, which is, which is, which is fine. Um, I would add another 5 ppm for my whoopsie dosage. And then I would know going forward that I would have 10 ppm left over or 5 ppm left over when I get to the end of boiling. So I'd have a 10 ppm dosage to start and I know I'd have roughly 5 ppm left over well what we do know about the sulfites is that it takes 5 ppm of sulfite to expel or expend or consume 1 ppm of oxygen so that means when you're down to your, your 5 ppm you have to add 1 ppm of oxygen before you expend said sulfites and then start oxygenating you really want to tailor that dose I mean, like I said, you can use whatever you would like. You could use a million PPM. You just got to know that one, it, it contributes into your water chemistry. Two, you have to expend them all before you oxygenate. And we'll get more into that. Uh, but three, uh, whatever three was, uh, we had oxygenation, water chemistry, and uh, whatever, we'll move on. doesn't matter. We'll talk about it more later. So the trifecta and the other blends, um, it, it's a more popular method because you can cut down on the sulfites, which, again, don't really matter because when you oxygenate, all the sulfites turn to sulfate and there is no sulfites. So one of the big uh, problems was people saying that antioxidants and what about people allergic to sulfites? Well, there is no sulfites because once you oxygenate, sulfites turn to sulfate and you're done. So that was another foolish argument made by people uh, that don't understand or have a concept of the process. 
uh, it's 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 a moot point. It doesn't matter. Like I said, you could use a million ppm dose, and as long as you oxygenate that million ppm, uh, you will have no sulfites. And if you do have residual sulfites, you're gonna know because the yeast aren't gonna ferment properly because sulfite is used to uh, basically inhibit yeast growth. So it's really easy. It's really straightforward, and that's why in my mind it was. A brilliant and ingenious uh, thought to come up with the, the sulfite use. And so, what you can do is you can back off on some of the sulfite and use ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is a fantastic, um, basically inert antioxidant. It's going to be in all sorts of packaged food goods. Anytime you would get a sliced fruit, Let's say you get a sliced bag of apples. They're gonna, it's gonna say vitamin C or ascorbic acid. Um, it's in hot sauces and different sauces. It's everywhere. We need it. We like it. Um, so you can use ascorbic acid. And and to the people who are gonna ask, well, why wouldn't you just use 100% ascorbic acid and call it a day? Well, for you guys, there's some there's some scientific papers and research, especially by Bamforth and others, that state that you really want to use ascorbic acid in the presence of free sulfur dioxide (SO2). Um, that's going to inhibit what is called a super oxidative reaction. Vitamin C ascorbic acid mixed with oxygen can super oxidate and basically um, not only negate its use but actually harm, not really harm, but affect the end product and affect in the way that you're going to oxidate your beer. And so if you use ascorbic acid, you always want to use some form of sulfur or I'm sorry, sulfur. Um, uh, molecule and so that will kind of mitigate that oxidative reaction or that super oxidation as they call it and so the other thing about the blends is you can add in some galatannins and galatannins are um, tannins from some kind of nut and that will bind and chelate and bind and drop uh, any heavy metals and so there's a there's a, a bond between the galatannins and the metals, and they allow them to settle down to the bottom and get them out of uh, basically free radicals out of your beer, and allow them to to settle in the trube or the uh, mash spent grain that kind of thing. There's some different manufacturers of the galatannins. There's Brutan B, which Y yeast is carrying. There's uh, um, Oh gosh, AEB is making a galatannin. There's another galatannin by, uh, I don't know, there's like three or four. They, they do the same thing. I think it's a gallo nut. That would make sense. Um, and so you can use these combinations to try and give you a uh, all-in-one covering of all this different stuff. So that's really cool. Uh, like I said, that, that uh, professionally made Antioxidant SBT, SBT is a pre-blend that is um, roughly 45% uh, meta, 45% ascorbic acid, and 10% galatannins. However, the cool thing is that you can make your own. All this stuff is, is pretty much off the shelf at the homebrew store that you can get. Um, you can get the galatannins, you can get uh, the meta, and you can get ascorbic acid as well. And so you can kind of mix and tailor your dosages to what you want to do. And that uh, is neat. All right. So what do we want to do in the mash? We want to underlet the mash if possible. Now, and the reason we want to do this is because if we're slowly adding water, here's your pot, here's your grains. If we're slowly adding water to the grains, we're slowly pushing that oxygen out of the grains that are trapped in the grains. And what we're allowing is a nice, slow, gentle push. 
you know, think of it, you know, floating a bobber or something like that. We're floating it up and we're gently expelling the oxygen towards the top of the vessel. And, and then um, with doing that, we really only have to worry about surface diffusion, which is 1 to 2 ppm. And if you have some form of cap on the top, then you, you really um, minimize your oxygen uh, interaction there. So please, please, please underlet the mash. If you're in a single brewing vessel uh, and you have a grain bag, bin, malt pipe, whatever they're calling it these days, you can use a pulley and just slowly lower that grain container uh, into the water like you would be underletting. Uh, and that is a, a good way to basically do the same thing uh, in a different setup. You want to employ a mash cap. You know, what is that mash cap? A lot of people will use um, floating cake pan pans, floating pizza pans, um, and you want it floating for the simple reason that if it is in contact with the surface, it will move depending on temperature changes and volume changes and all that fun stuff. So let's say you're doing a step mash. Well, as liquid heats, it expands. So when you dough in and start raising to do your different temperatures, your wort volume is going to expand. And that expansion, if your cake or if your mash cap doesn't float, isn't going to work. You're going to sink your mash cap or you might uh, have a gap underneath your mash cap. And if there's a gap, well, then you're not protecting against surface intrusion. And so the whole point of the mash cap is to um, uh, lessen surface diffusion and lessen uh, oxygen exposure. So definitely do that. We've had people do tin foil, foam, covered tin foil. Uh, just figure out something. Uh, Amazon and cake pans and pizza pans are usually you can get stainless and they're usually pretty cheap um, you know if there's a if there's a half inch gap around that's fine it doesn't have to be you know super super tight just get the bulk of it cover 90 plus percent if you can and it's only going to benefit you and so um, the reason why we do that it, well is obviously oxygen intrusion but what we're trying to do here is everything we're trying to do is to mitigate uh, oxygen intrusion and to mimic professional brewing. So what happens in professional brewing is that uh, these these macro beer producers, we'll call it, uh, uh, who will we pick on today? We'll call it Paul Enner. So Paul Enner's size compared to our size, there's a law, it's called the square cube law, and that law states as a vessel grows in size, bigger, um, it gets uh, taller instead of wider. And so what happens is when we have our small five gallon pots or 10 gallon pots or one gallon pot for that matter, um, our surface to our, our diameter to our height is much larger. As the height grows, the diameter shrinks. And so I forget, I did the math at one point on, um, a five gallon system compared to Weinstefan's uh, system. And I want to say it was something like 10,000, maybe 100,000 uh, times smaller compared to us due to their size. And the second thing about that is that their vessels are sealed. And so they don't have to worry about DO intrusion. So, um, just by purging headspace, even if they don't purge headspace, that's the reason why we use a cap. Because even if they don't purge their headspace, their, heads, their, their surface is so much smaller than ours comparatively. So that is why we do that. Um, consider con continuous recirculation. Um, like I said earlier, we like things to be more precise. You want everything homogenous. You want your enzymes to be able to free flow. You want uh, um, 
a nice homogeneous temperature and it's easier to, to keep temperature. Um, if you are recirculating, you want to make sure your return line is under the surface. If it is one of those sprinkler jobbies, throw it away. That does nothing but absorb oxygen and it's a disaster. Don't do that, please. Um, you'll want to reduce your flow, like I said earlier about shear stress. Um, we want to pump, but we want to pump gently. There's no need to create a massive vortex whirlpool while you're, while you're mashing or boiling. Uh, consider using a lotter cap. Uh, so the lotter cap would be the same as the mash cap, but it would go in a different vessel. So a lotter cap on the hot liquor tank that protect, protects you as you're lottering uh, into the mash tun or a lotter cap in the boil kettle that would protect you as you run into the boil kettle out of the mash. Uh, an easy way is no sparge brewing as well. That way you're not having to deal with a sparge or anything like that. Uh, 12 Play-Doh beer, 1048 beer, I'll argue should be made no sparge all day long. It's only when you get up above, you know, 14 Play-Doh, um, you know, 1055-ish is when your, your gravities are going to start to suffer. And so I would argue that any 12p beer or thereabout should always be made no sparge. It's just way easier and faster. If you are sparging, don't forget to uh, treat it with some form of uh, antioxidant. Uh, some people will just treat the whole batch, uh, strike and sparge water, and just hold the, the sparge during the mash with a, a lotter cap. That works too. Uh, pitch yeast and aerate. Uh, chill wort as rapidly as system allows. Uh, chill fast. Um, the longer the wort sets at a higher temp, the more um, heat stress and other things that can happen. You can change your wort profile, which will change your beer profile due to hop isomerization and stuff like that. Pitch enough healthy yeast. Um, we will get into yeast pitching um, amounts and and whatnot uh, ensure proper keg purging and consider using biological acidification or sour goot uh, I'll asterisk that one and say when using when making German beer it's not an option you have to if you want to do it right all right so grain crushing grain crushing is important to us um, much like many things are important to us that aren't important to the normal brewer. And that's because uh, there's reasons. And so grain crushing is one of those things. Um, many uh, malt mills, uh, there's a lot of science and engineering that goes into professional malt mills. And there's reasons. Um, what they found, especially the Germans making their pale continental lagers, is that uh, husks contain tannins. Tannins flavor your beer, and tannins will produce a different note. Um, and let me back up. Husks will produce a, a harsher note, I think is, is what they uh, specify. And so... Um, You have uh, home brewers basically have two options. They have a two roller mill and a three roller mill, and we want to keep the husk as intact as humanly possible to stop those f uh, little shards of husk getting into the finished product, which is going to make it uh, a little bit sharper, as they call it. So you'll always get a better crush with a three roller mill, but we understand that three roller mills are more expensive and not everybody has them. But with a three roller mill, you can have a coarser crush and then a finer crush and help you open that up. And so milling speed matters uh, much more than your style of mill. You want to mill really slow and when you're milling fast, that'll just pull the, and shatter the grain. And what we want is we want a nice fine crush. We want a slow rate, really, really slow. 
and you want to target under 100 rpm 60 or so i would say is probably the perfect speed and what you're going to do is drag that husk or gra drag that that kernel in and you're going to softly squish the kernel and let it open leaving you with a much in more intact intact husk and that is is going to be what you want because of these reasons and so even if you don't grain condition condition a slower better crush will yield a lot of these same uh, advantages and they are a coarser crush coarser crush improves lottering which means you're not going to get stuck sparges coarser crush inhibits locks so lipooxygenase is a enzyme and it's it's in the the endosperm right behind the arcospire and when that arcospire in the grain kernel is crushed and that is allowed to interact with oxygen that's when beer staling starts so that can happen as little as 15 minutes after grain crushing the minute you um expose that now the 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 curveball is it's only in pilsner malt any other malt the kilning kills that locks so it's a good thing to know with pilsner malt you want to crush as as soon with the least amount of time possible between crushing and doughing and so um Grain conditioning will improve husk elasticity. That's because you're going to add a little bit of moisture to that husk and turn it from dry and brittle to a little bit of more elastic. Um, a tighter gap on your mill. Uh, yield and atten attenuation increases. Conversion efficiency increases. Conversion duration decreases. Um, preservation of husk can improve stability. That goes into... Uh, um, more of that sharp flavor, um, crush as close to dough in as possible, use 1-2% to 2 water weight. And so what that 1-2% to 2 water weight of grain conditioning means is get a Rubbermaid tub or a brew bucket or a bucket or whatever, get a little spray bottle, put a couple ounces of water in it, spritz, turn, spritz, turn, spritz, turn. It's super easy. It's super fast. Everybody always um, overwets the grain. It's really, uh, it's really simple. It's probably I don't know what kind of sprayer you got, but it's probably ten spritzes and move your grain around. Let your grain sit um, ten minutes or so. Let it let it absorb that water and then crush, and you will have a beautiful crush. And so we talk about how to um, do some grain conditioning at a homebrew store or how to do it for people who don't have mills. Um, but just to, to round this out and end, you want to limit the time between when grain is milled and dough in is conducted due to the activation of oxidative malt compounds exposure to atmospheric oxygen. That is the locks and whatnot behind that arcospire in the grain. Um, it takes as little as 15 minutes. Um, always keep track of your crush. You don't want flour and you don't want uncrushed kernels. After mashing, always check your mash ton for uncrushed kernels. When you're cleaning out that grain, make note of how many uncrushed kernels you have because that's going to affect your brew house efficiency and all that kind of stuff. And so if you have a lot, then maybe look into tightening down that crush a little bit to uh, recoup some of that efficiency. So now brewing water. Um, Here's what we'll talk a little bit about metabisulfite meta uh, again some more, but uh, brewing water is important, um, but not so much for water profile, it's for water source. And so uh, we like to use our ore distilled. I mean, there are people who have beautiful brewing water right out of the tap or the well, and that's totally cool. For us around here, that's not even an option. So uh, we have to use RO distilled. The only reason we recommend RO and distilled 
mainly is because RO and distilled will be free of heavy metal ions for Fenton reactions, any of the copper, iron, manganese, that kind of thing, which we are uh, a very conscious about. And so if you do use uh, tap water or even RO and you don't have properly uh, passivated kettles, which very few people do, it's widely thought assumed that phosphoric acid and barkeeper's friend passivate stainless but it doesn't and if you doubt me just go ask nasa who has produced a shit ton of scientific papers on how to pop properly passivate stainless steel because they know because they go to the fucking moon and so uh nitric uh, acid and citric acid are the only two that passivate stainless steel properly again don't fight with me on this fight with nasa and so um You'll want to use that either or. Uh, you can use it. You don't have to use it. Metabisulfite in some kind of form is going to protect, protect you. Um, like I said earlier, it takes 5 ppm of metabisulfite to scavenge 1 ppm of oxygen. So um, 100 ppm of sodium metabisulfite. Uh, Na meta has the potential for... Uh, that and blah 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 and so that contributes to your water chemistry no one anymore is using those doses so basically um, you're gonna add roughly 5 ppm of meta or 5 ppm of um, uh, 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 K-meta or something like that it's really minuscule at this point where it's it's basically ne negligible um, calcium sulfate can be used uh, when higher sulfate levels um, calcium chloride is basically fine for 95 percent of the beer styles I like to target 40 40 to 50 ppm of calcium and use calcium chloride and let the chloride fall where it may. Um, if you are using a high dose of, uh, of sodium metabisulfite, make sure you watch those sodium levels, um, especially if you're going to use any baking soda or anything like that. And uh, reduce your dose as you tighten your system. We spoke about that. And make sure you're using some kind of sulfite strip to evaluate. Now, metabisulfite is a pH reducer. Again, if you're using the high uh, 100 ppm dose, you're going to see about a, a drop of about 0.1. But no one's really using that. And so everybody's using 25 ppm or less. So you're looking at 0 0.02. And so, it, again, it's probably negligible on, on what it's going to do for you. But just be conscious of that it does alter pH and water chemistry. And that um, is going to make a difference, potentially. So for recipe formula, uh, formulation, it's going to be a little different. And because... Um, <sighs> We're going to go again, and we're going to say HSA exists. And we know HSA exists uh, because it's in all the brewing scientific journals and uh, books. And so um, when you don't uh, have any HSA, it changes the color. So... HSA takes on a burnt orange color, much like if you slice a uh, apple and you set it on the counter and that white uh, meat is uh, going to turn brown and an avocado is going to turn brown and whatever else, iron is going to rust and steel is going to rust and all that fun stuff because oxygen interacts with things and causes things and so um, when you take out the oxygen of the brewing water 
and you mash, you're not going to get that that orange, that burnt orange tinge. It's going to be uh, pale, and um, not only is it going to have a different color, it's going to have a different flavor. And so uh, recipes have to be crafted differently. And um, here are some points on where you want to start looking. So due to the lack of hot side aeration, color will be, can re be reduced up to or more than 25%. And so you have to take into account that alone because if you make a, let's say a Pilsner, which Americans, uh, American brewers seem to think is all Pilsner malt, which it rarely is in Germany, uh, because they don't have HSA, they backfill that Pilsner malt with Vienna or Munich, and that's how they produce their, their nice straw slash golden colors. Um, once you do that, if you do pills only, it's going to be way too pale. It's almost going to be like green or waterish. And so you can not only color, add some color back in with some different malts, but you can add flavor, and we call it flavor loading. And so now instead of 100% uh, pills and it being a murky copper, it's going to be uh, up to 20% pills and be a beautiful gold and also pack the flavor punch of that Munich in there. And so that is definitely um, something to keep track of. Also remember more is not more. More is usually muddy. So just because you can add malts back to flavor doesn't mean that you can use a heavy hand and just start pulling shit off the shelf. You need to be conscious of what you're doing and what you're trying to do so many people get a heavy hand and just be refrained uh, Pilsner malt alone may lack depth and I spoke about that earlier you can use a blend of Pilsner and pale ale malt or pale malt to bring in some of those doughy and bready uh, kind of flavors because that's usually a more a little bit more robust malt. It's it's kilned a little longer And so you can kind of use that as flavor loading as well uh, Your wort flavor as I spoke earlier is gonna taste different um, it, It's not gonna be just like sickly and uh, cloyingly sweet you will maybe think it tastes like uh, honey or honey bunches of oats cereals um, honey graham or uh, golden grams stuff like that um, Vienna and Munich malts uh, blended in small amounts can add a muddy flavor and what that means is if I'm gonna add a malt what I'm looking for when I craft a recipe or when I try and make something that tastes like something commercial is that if I'm gonna add like 2% of uh, lower kilned malt. So let's say 2% of Vienna to 98% Pilsner. There's no way in, there's no way I'm going to be able to pick up that that Vienna and it probably isn't going to complement the Pilsner. So that's what I mean by muddy. Now if you're going to add it, add it in an amount 5% or more where it's going to actually uh, make it into the flavor profile and allow you to distinctly taste a difference. Whereas it's not just kind of like, I don't know, it's Pilsner or it's kind of like Pilsner. I don't know. You get Pilsner in Vienna. You get um, honey with dough. And then you can really start to get these defined flavor um, peaks, as it were. Um... Consider blending Munich uh, in all beers. You can blend, uh, there's three different Munichs now from Weirman, and I, that's all I'll speak about because I feel Weirman is the best and the only monster I will use. And so uh, they have the regular, the light Munich, the dark Munich, and the Barca Munich. And the, the Barca Munich kind of straddles the, the light and the dark, which is a great kind of... I don't know. I, I keep all three in, in stock on hand at all times. Um, higher caramels, uh, such as Caramunic, can be used successfully. Well, a lot of people who are not brewing low oxygen, who are just 
brewing regularly have a, a bad taste in their mouth, as it were, pun intended, about caramel and how it turns too sweet and yucky and it makes the beer sweet. Well, that's because you're oxidating the the flavonoids of the these malts which are causing them to be super sweet and so when you don't do that you can make a pilsner that is 98 percent pills two percent caramunic two and it is fucking glorious it tastes like well uh, eyinger's uh pilsner is caramunic and pilsner and so that would be a good benchmark it's a phenomenal beer it doesn't it doesn't taste like you think it tastes so just keep that in mind the other thing to keep in mind is that roasted malts such as carafa and roasted barley and those guys they come through wicked potent in fact i can easily detect up to a half of a, per, a half of a percent in a beer like right off the top i'm like oh yeah that's coffee and chocolate just boom and so when you're using in recipes that you would normally add three, five percent, you might want to look at scaling that back a little bit. It can be very overpowering. And that's where Cinemar comes in, where you can add your flavor component of your carafa. Let's say for a Schwarz beer, for me, it's a half to one percent of carafa with the rest Cinemar. And so you get your flavor profile you're looking for. But you're not going to get the color because it's not enough. So that's when you add in the Cinemar and, and that uh, works fantastic. So it may be necessary to revisit old recipes and reconsider their construction. Make your old recipe the way it was and then go tweak. Um, that's usually a, a better way. And don't forget you can use mini mashes to... Um, test new malts and flavors and mix them and do all that fun stuff. Um, not only is your, your, your malt and your grain going to be different, your hops are going to be different. Um, that has more to do with the soft boil. Um, the soft boil is, is a beautiful thing in terms of thermal stress and uh, wort flavor. So a soft boil is, is, uh, is a great thing, and we'll deal more with boiling later. But important things to know is that hop flavor will possess more presence and brightness. Hop aroma will be enhanced. Um, you can use high bittering hops or hop extract to save on um, any vegetal or anything like that. That's going to come really through now. Um, you're going to have a clean palate, as it were. So you have to be very uh, cautious, conscious of how many hops you're using in the kettle and what that's going to do. So also um, soft boils may alter hop isomerization. You might have to play with it a little bit. I really don't have an issue with that. And my boils are 2 to 3% boil off uh, under a 3-inch tri-clamp that's regulated. So, But keep it in mind, if... For some reason, your beers are not uh, as bitter as they used to be. Look and explore that. So mashing is one of the most important stages, if not the most important stage, of low oxygen brewing. Here you've preserved the phenolic malt compounds that would otherwise be oxidized upon doe-in due to high DO content. So I think it's important to note here that we hypothesize uh, professional brewing scientists hypothesize uh, that this it flavor that we spoke about, which is this fresh lingering grain, which is just one part of the it flavor. It, it's the it flavor is is kind of the the culmination of everything. But this fresh lingering grain, which is like the the quintessential first uh, part of the it equation is malt polyphenols or malt antioxidants and these malts malts in general and some foods in general contain natural antioxidants and um, when they are exposed to oxygen they oxidate and so uh, the hypothesis among the professional group is that if you don't 
have oxygen in your water and you dough in, you preserve these malt polyphenols and antioxidants, which not only will help you further on down the chain in case you in in um in case you come in contact with oxygen, but they also have their own flavor. And so like we said, it you're not creating this flavor. This flavor is inherent in the grain and every grain you, you have it's these malt antioxidants, uh, ascorbic oxidase in the malt and some other malt uh, polyphenols that uh, when they don't react with oxygen, i.e. no hot side aeration, they change flavor profile, which is another reason why I, I refuse to argue with people about uh, low oxygen brewing creating a different beer. It does. It has to. It, that is not the debate. The debate is whether you prefer what low oxygen brewing uh, makes versus standard brewing. Not that it's going to uh, create a different product because it is, and we already talked about that, so I won't go to, I won't I won't get into that anymore. Um, so you want to use deoxygenated water. So how do you deoxygenate water? Well, you have three options really. Uh, one would be to bring your water to a vigorous boil for five minutes. And the reason why you do that is, as we spoke earlier, um, boiling water can't hold oxygen, but it's the, the, the bubbling of the boils, uh, uh, the, the bubbling in the boil that drives oxygen out of the water. And so you want a nice vigorous boil because those bubbles are going to uh, take the oxygen out of the water. Then you want to chill your strike water as fast as possible and add some metabisulfite when it's under boiling and let that chill to the strike temperature. That's going to allow you to protect you from as it cools, things shrink, and it's going to try and pull in some oxygen as it shrinks. Um, um, now there's a yeast scavenging method, which, uh, my good friend Russ, uh, came up with, and that is quite ingenious as well. We know in brewing that when yeast is in the fermenter and fermenting that there is no oxygen because the yeast consume the oxygen. And so Russ had an aha moment and said, why the hell don't we do that to deoxygenate our strike water? And it worked uh, fantastically and so uh, what we what we recommend for that is um, it's really simple just use a uh, bread yeast and a simple sugar and uh, just uh, um, if you have 10 gallons of water uh, times it by two and that would be what you add for yeast and sugar so 20 grams of yeast and 20 grams of sugar. Wait a couple hours, and boom shakalaka, water deoxygenated. Now, we do talk about some, I'll talk more about the, the yeast scavenging later, but we, we are big proponents of continental beers, obviously, and continental malts. Continental malts will benefit from a step mash and um, if you're using uh, American grains to create American beers, I would argue against a step mash will probably hurt you. Those grains are, are very heavily modified and they're made for single infusion brewing. And so doing a step mash probably won't help you and it could end up even hurting you with shear stress, thermal stress, which also happens during mashing as well, not just boiling. And um, anytime you heat liquid or, or wort, uh, thermal stress can happen. Um, but uh, the big thing to take away from mashing and uh, mashing temperatures or process is that you don't mash beers based on the beer style. That's not even a thing. That shouldn't be a thing. That's not how it works. You mash beers based on the malt. You read the malt analysis and you figure out what the gelatinization temp is, what the time frame it is to take 
to be converted. All that stuff is gleaned from a malt analysis sheet. You do not mash beer based on a beer style. That is not how it works. And I will be more than happy to dedicate a full podcast episode to help people read malt analysis sheets. It's really simple. It's not complicated. But no one understands how it should be done. Now, to throw you guys a bone, I understand that a lot of people get their malt from uh, your local homebrew store who doesn't have a malt analysis sheet. And for you folks, if it's American single infuse, if it's German, uh, dough in at 144 for 20 minutes, raised to 147 for 20 minutes, uh, raised to 152 for 10, raised to 163 for 30, and mash out at 170 for 10. That is a fail-proof mash, sched mash schedule for a continental malt uh, based on a higher gelatinization temperature from drier growing conditions in the last few years. That's what I got. And so, um, so here we talk about, uh, or we can talk about the the yeast scavenging method, and you basically want to um, times times your volume by two, and that's the amount of uh, in grams of sugar and yeast. Now you want to give that some time. You know, yeast. Think of it as a a, a rising loaf of bread. You got to have at least an hour. Um, depending on temperatures. So if your wort's colder, it's going to take longer, just like a cold ferment would be in a fridge for some bread and, uh, you know, a cold fermented dough. And, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's warmer, then you will uh, be shorter. However, two to three hours is a good standard uh, time frame to do that. Uh, or if you are employing some form of a mash cap or lauder cap or hot liquor tank cap or whatever you want to call it cap, then uh, you can definitely do it uh, the, the night before. So uh, prepare your water the night before, uh, add your yeast and sugar, put your cap on, and come back tomorrow and start heating that up. Right when you start heating that up, make sure you add your metabisulfite. And so that's really a, a very um, condensed, not really condensed, but an overview of the mashing. Um, Really what you want to do is you want to get in, uh, be beneficial, make sure you're in the proper pH for the enzymes, make the wort, and get the hell out as fast as you can. You don't want to be sitting there longer than you should be. You're adding uh, thermal stress and potentially uh, shear stress if you are pumping that entire time. So get in, get out, uh, be done. Uh, the, the other thing you should, you should know is that if this is your first time brewing low oxygen, after you do your mash out or when you're running into your boil kettle, taste that wort. It's going to be the most gloriously uh, tasting, differently tasting wort you've ever tasted. It's magical. Don't forget to taste it. If you are a lottering, don't forget to treat your sparge water. Make sure you underlet, if at all possible, uh, sparge with care. Make sure you're not using any more of the, any of those sprinkler things. You're not whipping the wart with a whisk. Just uh, if you have to stir, just give it a gentle stir. Fold it like you would uh, making um, angel food cake or a heavy whipping cream. Um, and you got to be careful about cloudy runoff. So the, the other benefit we uh, we get from recirculating mash is that your wart is nice and clear and why that matters is not only because it's absolutely beautiful is because the clearer the wart is the less fat and lipids from the mash and the grains are in the in the wart and so fat and lipid uh, fats and lipids are in the malt inherently and when you're mashing you're creating fats and lipids and so um, you want 
the maximum amount of fats and lipids to be left in the spent grain and not in your wort. When you continue over uh, cloudy wort to your boil kettle, you're going to get a boil up foam, which is not hot break. That, that initial boil foam is going to be uh, off colored. It should be brilliantly white. If it is off colored, that is a surefire sign that you uh, had some HSA. That's called Teague. And that Teague shows uh, is an indication of hot side aeration. And so once that falls, um, you want a nice clear break with your hot break with nice uh, protein globs floating through the wart. Those protein globs uh, will change in size based on wart pH. Um, but you definitely want to see the separation. And um, the more fats and lipids you keep out of your boil kettle is the more you will keep out of your fermenter. And you do not want them in your fermenter because fats and lipids stale, uh, stale beer. That is one of the, the major beer staling uh, problems. So now we'll go into boiling since we're, we're logically there anyways. So boiling the wort is, is different. Uh, than you're used to and it is important to control th heat stress or thermal th stress or thermal loading there's a professional indicator uh, that is called TBI it's called the therobutic uh, acid indicator I want to say the the therobaric TBI, we'll call it today. Uh, my brain's not 100% with me. So uh, the TBI index is, is specifically made in professional brewing for thermal stress on the, on the wart. And high TBI is bad, and low TBI is good. High TBA is created from intense boiling, intense long boiling, and that's bad. Much like mashing, get in, uh, boil your wart, get out. And so hot side brewing process is really like that. You shouldn't be dilly-dallying and, you know, whatever. Get in, make your wort, get your yeast, be done. And so um, uh, it's important to call, control heat stress. This may come as a surprise. We read for years that vigorously vigorously boiling your wort is beneficial in many ways. Um, heat stress... Uh, accelerates oxidation and affects the flavor of the beer. Not only does it do that, it affects uh, coagulable, coagulable nitrogen and uh, different nitrogen contents of your wort, which uh, you want that in your wort uh, because you will have healthier fermentations and you will have better uh, flavor in your beer. And so some of the important aspects we talk about are controlling heat stress and again. And so limit your boil time to 60 to 70 minutes. 90 minute boils are uh, more homebrew dogma. Uh, just doesn't need to be done. Uh, consider a partially opened BK lid. Uh, you want to limit your evaporation to less than 10%. Target a simmer rather than a robust boil. If you can see the hot break swirling in your boil kettle, that is more than enough. It doesn't need to be leaping out. It doesn't need to be bubbling way up to the surface. As long as there is a, a convection inside that wart, you are good. Um, the, to go back a little bit and talk about why a 90-minute boil with Pilsner malt is a thing is um i'm not sure where that that comes from but the the pilsner malt is the only malt with uh dms potential uh potential dms um but it's ph dependent as well and so a higher boil ph which would be like a, a five four um boil ph will split the smm which is the precursor to DMS, uh, fast, uh, twice as fast or whatever, three times as fast uh, than a low pH going into the boil, like a 5.1 or a 5.2. And so an easy way to mitigate the 
potential for DMS is just that if you're using Pilsner malt, it's just to have a little bit higher boil pH starting of 5.4. And within 30 minutes, you will have no uh, issues with DMS. So don't forget, chill your wart as rapidly as you can. You know, um, thermal stress for the 8,000th time. And don't forget to oxygenate. Um, don't forget when you're oxygenating to account for your uh, sulfite dose because you cannot start oxygenating your wart until your sulfites are gone because sulfites are antioxidants. So you, <laughs> you need to oxidate all your sulfites and then you're at zero. Now you can oxygenate. And the problem is for a lot of people is they don't know when that is. So you got to use your sulfite strips. Oxygenate a little bit, pull a sulfite strip. If you're at zero, then do your normal oxygenation routine. Uh, but that kind of drives me bonkers as well. So just buy a damn DO meter and do it right. I'm sorry, that was aggressive. Um, you can look into buying a DO meter and getting the, the, the correct levels without guessing and your beer will be happier for it. So primary fermentation, so now we're done with the hot side process. We got out of there as fast as we could, but we, we got the proper enzymes working, our beta and our alpha, and we got a nice fermentable wort, and we uh, uh, summarized our hops, and we didn't boil too long, and the wort didn't pick up more than one SRM in the boil. If your wort picks up any color in the boil, uh, any more than a, you know, a half to one SRM, you're boiling way too hard. That's heat, that's thermal loading, heat stress, TBI, turn it down. Uh, so now we're going into the fermenter, but, but what we, we're going to do some form of a whirlpool in the boil kettle because we want to knock out all that sediment, hot break. Now, cold break isn't formed until the wart hits, I think, below 80 degrees or something like that. So cold break won't come out of solution until your wart hits that. So everything that's falling initially is hot break. Hot break must be removed. It is not even an option. In all professional literature, it says get that shit out of here. It has zero nutritional beneficial effect to yeast. All it is is fats and lipids. And it's going to steal your beer. So cold break, however, the break that is formed um, after that work gets cooler, some of that is beneficial. So the yeast, it contains nitrogen and some other things. And so the yeast will flourish. Well, they'll like that. But again, too much of a good thing is not a good thing anymore. The dose is the poison. So, um, get a clear wart going into the fermenter. And so, even by our standards, a clear wart is still cloudier than general high-end professional runoff. And so, we're going to have a little bit of that cold break still remaining. So, we'll be good. And so, um, active yeast is your friend. Um, and it's presence before oxygenation. Uh, just make sure your yeast is healthy and ready to go. Now, pitching rates for cold fermentation or lager fermentation, uh, I will say that less than 2.5 is not enough. 2.5 or more um, for lager fermentations, it's not an option. Um, you want to ensure everything's mixed. You want to oxygenate to at least 8 ppm DO, and you went and bought your DO meter, and so we know that, right? Right? Yep, we did. Yep. Okay. And so um, pitching rate for ales is, uh, I don't know, 0.75 to 1.5. I like to target 1.5. Again, I always um, count my yeast. I know their yeast... Uh, they're active, they're healthy, um, all that stuff. I scope them, I count them. And so I'm always pitching at at least 2.5 for lagers and 1.5 for ales. And that's the way I do it. Um, the simple fermentation for lagers, uh, since we're primarily lager brewers here, are cool wort to 5 to 6 degrees. Um, 
add your yeast, allow beer to rise uh, to 8C, so allow it to just come up over temperature and then hold it at 8 to 9. For us Americanos, that is, uh, what is it, uh, basically uh, 32 plus 10 is 42 degrees roughly, cool it to 42, let it go to 45, and um, hold it there at 45-ish or so. And uh, if you're spunding, you wanna target 1% remaining extract prior to, to uh, transfer. And 1% extract remaining means uh, four bri uh, one bricks, four gravity points, or one Plato. One Plato is roughly four points, one bricks is roughly four points, and four gravity points is roughly four points. And so um, we're going to know when that 1% is because we're going to do a fast fermentation test. And fast fermentation tests are super easy, unlike what most people make them out to be. And here's how we're gonna do a fast fermentation test that is so simple and so accurate. Remember when we oxygenated and pitched our yeast? Yeah, we're just gonna pull a sample of that, a couple hundred mils, or enough to fill a hydrometer uh, deal, and uh, then we're gonna go put that in the warmest part of our house for two days or so, and then we're gonna read the gravity and, and magically that's gonna be what your batch is gonna be because you're using the same yeast at the same pitch rate, at the same wort, at just a higher temperature. But we're not gonna use a stir plate because using a stir plate artificially keeps the yeast in suspension and will, could, possibly alter your final gravity. I don't know why people fret about fast fermentation tests and about how they're difficult and why you would use a bread yeast or do whatever the hell goes on there instead of just grabbing a stupid sample right from your fermenter when you pitch yeast. Super easy. And so we're going we're gonna to pull that off that fermenter with 1% remaining and um, now we're going to go to the cold side. However you did the hot side, if you did it low oxygen, you didn't do it low oxygen, who the hell cares? Um, everybody should be in agreement here, which we're not, which is odd and frustrating and stupid. But, so we're going to rack that over. We're going to spund. If you missed the spund, you can always sugar prime your fermenter where you would take your your sugar amount that you would add to your uh, bottling bucket if you are bottling let's say it's two ounces let's say it's four ounces you're going to add that to i don't know 10 to 12 ounces of water you're going to dump that you're going to boil that water you're going to boil the shit out of that water for a couple minutes with the sugar in it then you're going to go with that hot ass uh jar of water that's boiling and dump it right in your fermenter your fermenter thermal mass is going to cool that but you didn't add a shit ton of oxygen uh, because that was boiling hot and then you're going to allow your fermenter to start re-fermenting again for an hour or two. And when you see your airlock bubbling like crazy again, you're going to rack that shit right over to the keg. And that is wicked easy. However, uh, that is the last uh, step. Uh, that is the last ditch effort. It's going to add a little bit more alcohol to your beer. It's going to add potentially a different flavor. And so you really want to do the spun. If you can't do the spun, do the, the fermenter prime. Don't ever, ever, ever rack still beer over to a keg unless you want that shit to oxidate like immediately. So um, now that you produce that wort and you transfer it to fermenter, you, you begin the next phase of flavor protection. And so you have to be, oh, just crazy about cold side oxidation oxidation you can rack this over to a, a a keg where you're gonna spun and serve out of and you're gonna have one percent extract remaining and the reason why we transfer actively fermenting beer is because we know from earlier actively fermenting uh yeast with sugar are gonna consume oxygen so any DO pickup in your hoses, your transfer, your improperly perched keg, because we can't perch kegs properly. And I use we as a term of 
basically everyone on this planet. And so um, we're going to use the, the yeast to our advantage there and help them or have them mop up any uh, bad stuff for us. And so there's a couple different ways you can do that. And um, both of them involve a properly, not properly, that's not the right term, a purged keg to the best of our abilities. And we have two ways to do that. Um, we have blog posts discussing them, but one is to completely fill the the keg to the brim and then push that out with sanitizer. The other way is to actually forego your airlock and connect your fermenter out directly to your keg out. So your dip tube goes all the way to the bottom and then fermentation will actually purge that keg. Six and one half dozen of the other, they'll both do what you need them to do. Um, and then you're just going to do a close transfer. So let's say you're like uh, many home brewers who have a, a stainless uh, brew bucket with a spigot on it. So that spigot is going to attach to a hose. That hose is going to attach to your liquid in, or I'm sorry, out your dip tube of your keg. Your keg in is going to return to your top of your fermenter where your airlock was that creates a closed loop where you're pushing co as you push beer in from the bottom you're pushing co2 back into the fermenter on top and uh <clears throat> that allows for this closed loop and uh there's a there's there's other ways to do it that's just one that i highlighted and i don't need to get into all of them i don't think so lagering and packaging um if you are making a lager and you go into the spunding vessel, you allow fermentation to complete and you'll know when fermentation is complete because you took a fast fermentation test and that fast fermentation test determined our fermentability. So we know exactly where it's supposed to end, right? Yep. And so um, once it gets to its final gravity, then we will commence the lagering phase. It's going to stay in that uh, keg and lager for as long as you want. Um, and uh, you have an option instead of going to the keg, you can go to the bottle right from the fermenter called bottle spunding. Or instead of uh, you can let it ferment out completely and add your bottling sugar to a uh, diluted, boiled the shit out of water in your fermenter. Let that start going again and then rack your bottles uh, off your, your fermenter. Um, again, never transfer still beer. Never transfer still beer. If you're tr waiting till fermentation is ceased, then you're racking to a bottling bucket, then you're adding sugar, and nothing is active at that point. By the time that beer hits the bottle, it's oxidized, oxidized as shit. And so it'll take week, a uh, week or days for that yeast to wake back up and start eating that sugar, and by that time, it's too late. You've already oxidized it. Um, you can can and you can can condition where you can do the same thing you would be with bottling or you can try and, um, counter pressure fill into the can, um, counter pressure filling into the can, you will, uh, have oxidation. Uh, I do can conditioning on my Hepfeisen's. I rack, uh, right from the fermenter into the can and uh, seam the can and then my Hefeweizens are can conditioned and so the yeast is in there and everything so if you want to you know shake up the can a little bit you can get the yeast if you don't you don't have to and it was uh, properly carbonated and um, zero oxidation. Uh, so the goal of the paper was to allow the home brewer uh, varying levels of expert uh, experience uh, to adapt and incorporate basic concepts. And as I said before, you can do the hot side. You don't have to do the hot side. But if you're not doing anything on the cold side, uh, you should be because your beer will be better because of it. Um, 
the document has been constructed to be interactive so anywhere on our document if you see anything in red that is a hyperlink to a blog post or some kind of documentation and um <clears throat> And I'm not going to deep dive into that because I'm going to go into every individual blog post and basically have a podcast about said blog post. And so um, we'll just leave it at that. And don't forget, if you want a, co a copy of this paper, you can click it on the bottom of the page. Also, don't forget about our references pages. Um, our reference pages are very comprehensive on all our references, all our books all our documents, scientific journals, papers, everything. We seem to be the only group that, number one, is forced to produce scientific literature, even though we have it in copious amounts. And I probably have hundreds of documents that I haven't uh, put on the web yet because it's kind of laborious and boring. And at the end of the day, I really don't give a shit. Uh, if people see, cause here's the deal. Cause people ask where our documentation is and then we post said documentation and then they don't read it. So it's kind of this, 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 uh, never ending circle of where's your documentation. Here's my documentation. Did you read my documentation? No. Where's your documentation? We already posted it. Well, I'm not going to read that bullshit. Tell me what it's about. No, 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 that's not how it works. And so, um, anyways, don't forget to check our documentation. Uh, there's hundreds of articles and whatnot there now, and they can answer a lot of questions. Uh, we're not f afraid of our sources. We're not afraid to be challenged. Just back your shit up with science. And uh, um, we are ever adapting and changing uh, what is right today might not be right tomorrow. And we are fully uh, willing and ex accepting uh, to uh, accept that. Uh, we are trying to make the best beer humanly possible. And um, if, if something changes that, that goes against what we're doing now and allows us to make better beer, we're going to do it in about two seconds flat. And so that's another difference between us. Uh, we don't really subscribe to dogma. Um, we are on the cutting edge and we kind of free float uh, to allow us to get the best products humanly possible. So with that, that'll be the end of podcast zero two. And hopefully that helps uh, kind of deep dive into the paper and the whys and the hows. And in the next one, we'll probably uh, cover something on the blog and kind of deep dive into that. Probably something of, of higher interest like CO2 and CO2, uh, all the stuff with CO2. That seems to be a, a eye opener and a, a mind blower for folks uh, that uh, the bottle CO2. Uh, so we'll just do this. We'll do a, a sneak peek. The CO2 you are using is impure and adding oxidation. But anyways, that'll be a, a topic for another episode that should uh, perk your ears up a little bit. And um, we will uh, see you next time. Cheers.